Thanks very much for coming. Hope you're having a great day at RubyCon so far. My name is Nick. I'm talking about Warbler today. And the whole idea behind Warbler, for those of you who are not you know, very familiar with the concept, is what I'm going to do with it is really bring a new audience uh, to the world of Ruby. And so allow, to allow those of you developing applications, new possibilities for a way to build those applications and how to deploy them, and bring those applications to new, new people, new places, and new uh, environments. So new audience, take your app applications to new places, and make it easy in the process. So I'll get in, you know, in a little bit, I'll get into what that really means. Uh, I will say with some caveats that if you're the kind of person who has, who likes to have high control over their application, so if, if you're developing a web application, you control the servers, maybe you're a fan of the DevOps sort of mode, where you have all the knobs at your disposal, you control your servers, you know what goes on them, you know how they're configured, um, and you don't have to throw, you don't have to work with anyone else, you don't have to throw your work over the wall to someone else, you're just content working on your own, deploying your servers and maintaining them under your own control, then I'll probably say with, with pretty, um, pretty, cer pretty much certainty that Warbler is not gonna be for you. So Warbler is really about taking your applications, packaging them up into a unit that allows you to take them somewhere else and, and run them as easily as possible with the minimum amount of dependency and hassle on the other side. And so how we do this is we take advantage of the ubiquity of the Java virtual machine and its ability to be cross-platform. Now you say, well, okay, Java virtual machine, that's a pretty, that's a pretty big dependency, and I'll give you that. And you'll say, and you know, it also might feel like a little bit heavyweight and you can't always rely on it. Uh, and what about the cross-platform part of the JVM? What about write once, run any, everywhere? Um, wasn't write once, run everywhere supposed to be write once, debug everywhere? Well, that may be the case. Uh, I've actually found in my experience as a, job, as a Java developer for 10 years that I can pretty faithfully write code on one operating system and deploy it on, onto a Java virtual machine running on a different operating system and expect the program to at least run with pretty similar characteristics. Maybe not performance characteristics, that's of course a different story, but operating characteristics and behavior uh, certainly are very consistent across platforms, so this makes a great, great option. And I'll just contrast this to the, the Ruby option, where if you, if you really want to try to do cross-platform Ruby, you're really talking about installing a C compiler on every machine where you want to use Ruby. And to me, that just kind of feels like re repaving a road every time you want to go somewhere. So I, you know, the Ruby is great when you have control over the environments and you can afford to have a C compiler running on your production systems, but if you don't want that, then the JVM and Warbler could be for you. So let's run through a few uh, possible use uses that you might consider using Warbler for. Uh, the first one was sort of the original reason that I wrote it, and that's if you want to write a portable web application. So you have a Rails application, uh, use, you uh, run Warbler against your, your application and it creates uh, what, what in Java parlance is called a war file, which is basically a zip file with a bunch of, uh, with, with all of your application's files in it. I'll show you a little bit more about the structure of that later. And Java has this war, this war file standard that most Java uh, application server containers can accept a war file and you just put it in, you tell the server where this file is and it opens it up and sets up all the files and, and and boost the application for you. And this is pretty standard across most Java servers, so it's, it's actually a really nice thing. There are a lot of enterprise organizations that run strictly by uh, having their development or QA or release management team build the war file, and that war file gets handed off to the operations team where they actually maintain and run the application. So that's, a, that's actually a pretty standard operating model outside of the DevOps space that, that a lot of you might be used to. Another area is you can do cross-platform cross Ruby, uh, GUIs really easily. Uh, again, taking advantage of Java in this case, the, the Swing uh, UI toolkit that's actually built into the JDK it works reasonably well for, for lots of kinds of things. It's the, the knocks against Swing are that it's not doesn't look as native to the platform as you'd like, and that may be the case, but if you're looking for ubiquity and cross-platform, you, you're probably not as concerned about uh, the look and feel of a particular, particular platform. If you were, you'd probably take the, more, take the time necessary to investigate native uh, uh, GUI options for that platform. But with, with Ruby GUIs, you can write uh, a few tens of lines of JRuby code and boot up the UI really quickly on just about anywhere where there's a Java virtual machine. And Warbler will allow, allow you to create a, a, a self contained JAR file that you can use anywhere that's a JVM. 
Another option that uh, kind of that Warbler can help you with is distributing your application without source code. And this is actually a pretty novel one, I think, in the Ruby community. There have been maybe a couple of attempts I'm aware of to create some sort of source code obfuscation mechanism. Uh, JRuby actually comes with one built in that works pretty well. I, I can show it off to you later in a demo. What happens is we can compile a Ruby file, Ruby script, down to a Java class file. Uh, and we'll put the Java class files in the application archive instead of your Ruby scripts. And then you don't have you, your scripts stay out of the archive and you don't have to ship them and the application will still work. And the reason why that works is because the class files that get generated by JRuby are fairly fairly opaque in the way that they translate to bytecode. And so even though some of you are familiar with Java say, well, if you have a Java class file, you can also decompile that back to Java source, right? Well, that may be true, but as I can show you later if you're interested, uh, decompiling a Ruby script compiled by JRuby into a class file back to Java gives you uh, very little resemblance to the original script. So as I mentioned before with the web application um, example, if you don't have much control of your deployment environment, this is really going to be an ideal situation for you because when you're doing this, if you, what you probably want to do is actually simplify deployment so that the person that you're telling to actually deploy the app uh, has as few instructions as possible. So generating a WAR file and telling them to put it, boot it in a Java application server, handing them a jar file and say, run this, you know, run this jar file with, Java, with the Java virtual machine. You know, minimize the number of steps that it takes to get them running. Don't make them install this gem and that gem and run this build stuff. You know, make it as, as quick as possible. And that's, that's really what Warbler is about here as well. Uh, another option, which happens to come along with JRuby sort of for free, is that we actually do have really good Windows support as well. Uh, both by virtue of the JVM cross-platform Windows support and work that we've actually done ourselves to provide a good operating environment for Windows. We still do have glitches now and then. We even have showstopper bugs that cause us to, to release the second uh, point release on the same day, like we just had uh, the other day with JRB 155. Uh, those things happen, but uh, we, we are committed to the Windows platform, and we think that JRB is a, is a great option for developing and, and running Ruby applications in, in a Windows environment. So the reason this all got started is sort of because of a square peg round hole kind of a problem. We wanted to, we, it, it seemed natural working in a Java environment that you'd want to take a Rails application and build it into a war file, which is what the Java application servers take. And so we started to think about how that actually works. And if you look at a Rails application uh, directory structure, uh, you don't need to worry about reading the labels, you probably recognize the structure just by visual contours only. Uh, you look at a Rails application structure, and one of the things that sticks out with Rails is you, you run your application in a directory, and uh, all the code in your application sits below the directory in a bunch of different other folders and directories, except for one special uh, directory, and of course that's public, where all of your static assets live. Now, when you flip that out around to the, to the war file side, you usually have a war file like this, with where you have all of your static assets sitting in the top level of the archive file. And instead, inside, inside the war file, there's a specially named uh, by convention directory called webinf that Java war files use. And this is where the, your application code lives. And, and part of the standard, the specification for war files is that Java application service should never serve any content out of that directory. So if you have code living there, you can be sure that you're not leaking your code out to the outside world. And obviously, if you're going to put your code in an archive, you need to have this some kind of structure like this. And so you have this sort of outside in, inside out mapping that needs to happen uh, in order to get this to work. And so after, after a little bit of deliberation and playing around with this, I kind of came up with this sort of structure here, where we're basically swapping different parts of the application around from the, from the directory structure over to the war file. And what you see here with the green boxes is uh, the application code, of course, goes into that special web INF directory I was talking about. And your static assets, images, JavaScripts, and style sheets go back up to the root of the war file. Now, originally, when, when I started working on this back in the, the late Rails 1, early Rails 2 days, this was a little bit more problematic because Rails had this hard coded notion of where, where your static assets should be. It always said, you know, Rails root slash public. Well, that's where it is. Well, there's no public directory in any of this any of this structure over here. So over time, we, I had to kind of submit patches to Rails to kind of extract that mechanism away. And I think that, that we're pretty well set now that uh, I, can, can, I can, with this structure, I can tell Rails up front 
the public directory is actually up here, and the application code is here, and, and more or less works. So I'll, um, show, I'll show a little bit more about the web stuff later when I get into demos. So if you want to get started, it's really simple. World is it to, world is it to jump and installed in the normal fashion. And then it gives you a warble command, and you go inside of your project and just run that, and it creates a warp app for you. That's it. Done. Go home. Um, of course, there's more to it than that. I'll get to that. Uh, I want to point out, too, that you can actually run Warbler from CRuby. Uh, I actually do have it on my roadmap to test it with Ruby 1.9. Um, you can run it with CRuby. Uh, it's not preferred because if you're doing any more extensive Ruby development with JRuby, you're probably going to run across a JRuby specific gem, and it's going to be difficult to trick uh, Warbler into picking the right gem to put in your application when you're running it with a different Ruby. So for now, if you're doing um, bigger applications, um, always use Warbler from within JRuby. If you want to just play around with it and just do small scripts, you can certainly run it with, with uh, CRuby just fine. So how does Warbler find out what to put in your, in your files? Of course, the first mechanism we can use is Bundler. We can detect the gem file in your project and boot up Bundler and tell it to, to iterate all the dependencies in the project. We can make sure those gems get copied into the archive. So for this works great for Rails 3 projects or other projects where you start using Bundler. Uh, for older projects that don't use Bundler, there is a way around that. I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, if you're doing a regular a non-web style project where it's just going to be a jar file with some Ruby code, what we do is we expect the, sta the standard Ruby application structure where you have a, a, some executable in, in the, the bin directory and you have some require paths and some files and you may have some dependencies as well. And we basically, if you have a, gem, uh, a dot gem spec file in your current directory, we'll, do, we'll load that up, get all of this information out of there, and use that to build the application. Um, so if, you, if your application doesn't fall into either of those, you can, you can still try a warbler, and maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. It does try to guess at things. It doesn't always get them right, but if it doesn't, we have a configuration mechanism. So you run this config, op, uh, config command, warble config, which gives you uh, a nice warble template. And if you look, open that and look it up, there's, uh, it just looks, it's just a regular Ruby code, uh, much like you see in Rails and lots of other places where you have configuration using some sort of a config object and a file. <coughs> and this file is actually relatively big. All the, all the options available to you are fully documented in the comments for that file. You can, of course, delete whatever you don't need, but that's a good place to start. And you can, you can do pretty much everything you need uh, within this file if you, if you need to go beyond the, the defaults for what we're looking for. Another application of Warbler that's interesting is to embed it in a rake file. So rather than using the standalone Warbler command, you can actually have just integrate Warbler as part of, part of your rake build process. And, this is, and Warbler was originally architected around rake, so this is actually really easy to do. I just have a Warbler task class, and you can create an instance of that somewhere in your rake file, and it will define uh, some tasks. Uh, and you can actually you can take this a little bit further. If you want to build in a diff multiple different configurations inside the same build, you can actually declare multiple Warbler task objects, give them different names, give them different config objects, and then pass, uh, pass in the parameters that you see there. So now I want to go into just a little bit about the internals of Warbler and how it's kind of evolved up to where it is today. Uh, the new release that's coming out soon has a structure that's sort of like this. At the, you just saw the, the task object in code. And there's also the config object, you saw, you saw an example of that. It's, there's also a class called jar, which is as you would expect. And jar is actually pretty easy to just use standalone as a nice little wrapper around the zip APIs. You can just create a, create, create a jar like this, and jar has a files attribute, it's actually a hash of all the entries inside of the archive. And so the keys to the hash are the paths inside the archive, and the values are can be a couple different things. They can be uh, nil, which means just create a directory entry for that for that label, for that key. It can be a, an I/O object, uh, for example, a string I/O you could use to create an in-memory file that will get stored into the archive, <coughs> or you can just give it a string, which is which represents a file name on disk. And that that file name can be absolute and point to somewhere else. It doesn't have to be living even living in your current project. And I actually take advantage of this inside Warbler to package the gems. So when you 
run Warble and it starts looking for gems to include in the archive, it will just pick up all the files from the gems right out of your, your gem directories without having to copy them anywhere. So that works pretty nice. And so create, create it gives you that jar file. And then if you, look, if you look at the contents of that jar, you see that the entries that were, were put in there as a result. Um, you see I, the script actually created three entries, but there's actually four here. Whenever you create a, a, a entry with multiple <coughs> slash separated uh, paths in them, that it considers those directories as well, and it ensures that there are directory entries all along the way. Uh, so I'm going to jump back here. So going back to the the structure, internal structure of world, a new feature that I built for the, the new release is this concept of traits. And I did this to sort of separate out the logic between web applications versus regular applications, and also to, to split out the logic amongst the different kinds of things that you might find in your project that would <coughs> configure Warbler and tell how to build what it builds. So you see along the, the right side of the screen here, uh, War, Jar, Bundler, Gem, Spec, Rails, Rack. So it will look inside of your, your project and look for things like the presence of a config environment RB file or a config.ru file, or a gem file, or a gem spec file, and it will add, automatically add these traits into your configuration and apply them as it's building the file. So another thing that came in a recent version of Warbler is something I'm calling features, which is sort of a way to tag on extra behavior and, uh, that kind of processes the war file uh, uh, the contents of the WAR file mutates it before it actually creates the archive. And so you see here uh, the command Warble executable compile WAR is actually a valid Warble command. And what it does is it creates a WAR file that is executable, means that we, I'll show you what that means in a minute, and compile means it does what I did, uh, told you about before, where it obfuscates the, the scripts by combining them to class files and only putting the class files into the archive for you. And so this idea of features is a way to say, well, if, you know, here's a common pattern of transforming certain aspects of the files, and we want to do that repeatedly and bundle it up into an extra task that can be um, used. And then it also gives you a nice command line for you know, saying, Warble, you know, Warble creating a compiled war as opposed to a plain war. Um, and depending on how people start to use this, as, as word gets out more about this, um, I, Hoping that this can kind of turn into a <laughs> type of plugin system that we can maybe discover other people's uh, features and we can pull those in and use those as part of the, the war building process or the jar building process. All right, so I actually have a big slate of demos here. And I, I still, see I still got quite a bit of time, but I think I'll probably use most of it up doing demos. Uh, this is really where, where the rubber hits the road, and I'll show you kind of what's happening inside of Warbler. So the first thing I want to do is one of the demos involves uh, some connectivity. And since the Wi-Fi is so bad here, I actually brought a little Airport Express with me, and it's plugged in down here below the desk. So you should be able to find that. It's, it's just an Airport Express, so it has a, probably not going to be able to accept connections and log in the room. But if a few of you want to try to connect up, uh, look for this SSID in your, in your wireless networks. Connect to it, and you can download this, this jar file that I pre-built just for this, the purpose of this demo. Um, so, and that may take a, a couple minutes, so I'm actually going to do a different demo first, so I'll get back to this demo in a minute. That's probably okay. So what I have here is, um, I have uh, a copy of Redmine from a relatively recent, recent revision on GitHub. And I, asked, I added, Redmine, unfortunately, out of the box does not warble cleanly. It does not pick up all the things you need. So you could either uh, set up a config file, which is which would be really easy to do, and I've done. But in, instead, in this case, I chose to take Redmine and just simply add one revision, which introduced a, gem, a bundler gem file for this this rail, uh, Redmine application. Um, so we can actually look at that. So this is what this is what this is the gem file that I created for for Redmine, uh, which is not it's pretty actually pretty straightforward. So what I can do is um, I can say Warble. Um, I can just run Warble by itself, and that will give me a war file in a few seconds. So 
some errors here with some some extra artifacts inside Redmine that I haven't bothered to look into, but it's actually not not fatal, so you can ignore those. So it says creating a creating a war file, and that's it. So if you look at Redmine.war, it's actually a little bit beefy. It's about 18 or 19 megs, uh, and this is because we're you know bundling all the dependencies in, including including JRuby itself. So if I look inside this war file, you can see uh, you can see there's a fair number of jars in here. There's some jars for the Active Record JDBC gem, jars for Bounty Castle. Uh, there's a MySQL JDBC driver in here, as well as uh, the JRuby core libraries themselves. And all that gets put in for you, but either by detecting the gems that the project needs, or, or just by virtue that we need to include JRuby in there to make it completely standalone. Stand so another interesting thing we can do, instead of just creating a war file, is to say, like I showed you, executable war. And now what we've done with executable war is we're actually embedding a little Java web server inside of the, the war file, and we can actually s start it. So I could say, um, just to show you that I'm not picking up any files out of the Redmine um, uh, application, I'll just copy that war file over to slash tmp. I'll just select CD over there, and I'll Turn off RVM so that I'm not picking up the gems um, that are installed for Redmine, and I'll just simply run Java minus jar Redmine dot war. <coughs> so it says it's running. So I go to Winstone is your app server. Winstone, yeah. Uh, we can. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I chose Winstone initially because um, I, I, I stole the idea for this technique from the Hudson Continuous Integration Server. It does a similar thing where it'll embed Winstone inside the Hudson War file, so you can run it in this manner. And so I just went with that. It's a fairly lightweight one, not minimally intrusive, and it was easy to get embedded quickly because it has a command line for that already. Uh, but I'm looking at some other servers in the future, I'm watching that. So you can see Redmine is running. Uh, I have this instance of Redmine configured to talk to MySQL, as you know, because the, the driver, and I've already got the data, I've already got a database <coughs> running there, so you can actually see, uh, see some of the data coming out of the database here. And so, you know, what would you do with this sort of thing? Well, this is kind of nice. You have a web application and a single war file. You could, you know, you could create a small one. Maybe you want to push it out to a bunch of desktops and run it there. You could embed the, the uh, you could embed the database uh, location, username and password in the war file as well. And if, if you're not too concerned about security, maybe you have some sort of a, you know, an internal, uh, maybe you want to build an internal web app that people can use to talk to a database, but you don't, um, you don't want to have a central place to deploy it for, for whatever reason. I don't know. Maybe I'm being a little bit, um, a little bit too, too hand wavy with the use case here, but I think you get the idea that you can take this 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 file and give it to anyone else in your company who has a Java virtual machine installed, and they could get, get this red line up and running on their on their machine without with very little trouble at all. So that's red line. Oops. All right. Uh, next demo. Okay, so now we're getting to the piano demo. So what I have is, uh, has anybody been able to download the, the piano jar file? Yeah. Did you actually start it? Yeah, I did. Did it pop up okay? Yeah, of course. Okay, cool. Um, so let me just, just to show you that there's no Java um, in this project. Run that command, no Java anywhere in here. Um, I can run Warble in here. And it'll end by, oops, is this, is this, is this, no, I'm sorry, not in the right directory. So, so here's my, my Ring Piano project. And you can see there's a gem spec file there. Try that again. 
they're created by writing piano jar. Um, and again, it's a little bit big, but I mean, most of that eight, eight, eight plus meg bulk is just the JRV jars that are embedded in there. Um, so we can start this up. Um, a lot of, in a lot of places, I think both on Windows and Mac, you can actually double click a jar file and it will just launch itself. You can also run it on the command line like this, java minus jar, jar file, just like I did with Redmine. Needs MIDI? Yeah, it's out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it does need MIDI. All right, so you can see here, um, I actually have a couple windows. And before the talk, um, I was able to get my friend Jay to come up and get this going as well. And you can see we've actually got um, a couple different people hooked up here. So um, what this little ring, the reason why this application is called Ring Piano is because it's actually using Rinda. And it's creating a, a Rinda ring server on the local network on my little airport. And in the ring server, we register a tuple space, which is going to be a tuple space to hold notes on the piano. And so this, when you press buttons on this little interface, it'll put the note on request, note on, and note off request into the tuple space. And then elsewhere, there will be a process or a thread that's trying to pull those note on, not, note off commands out of the tuple space and use them. So Jay, you want to go ahead and click a couple things? And I can play from my this side too. I should probably unplug the mic because it's a little bit um oops. Oh, I lost mic. Sorry about that. The volume of my computer is overwhelming Jay's. So we're both playing notes and then we're both we're both hitting keys, and then we're also playing notes on each other's computer. It's kind of getting, it's bouncing back and forth through the tuple space. So, um, if, you know, if, if we had a better network and a better UDP broadcast kind of heartbeat signal, we could get a whole bunch of computers in the room hooked up and all be collectively playing music together. And the point of this is that, um, you know, you know, fellow over there and Jay as well, uh, simply downloaded a, a pre-built version of this, this jar file off of my computer, uh, like I showed you there before. So there were no other. Um, Dependencies, no other, no other steps to take other than to download that jar file and just run this. And so that's sort of demonstrating the cross-platform uh, UI aspect. Uh, so we can actually, I'll just take this opportunity to show you the compiled stuff now. Uh, Java or Warble compile jar. <coughs> So this will do the we'll, this will do the compilation, and if we look at this now, uh, so you can see here is the here's the here's the actual layout of the of the jar file. You can see the JRuby libraries are embedded up here. Um, there's actually, a, I actually put a special file in the jar file called main.rb that just says to load up the, the executable in the bin directory. And then, that, of course, that's here. And then here's where the actual application code lives. Um, and now if we go down here, we see um, we've got some RB files in here, but actually, if you go in and look at those, they don't have any actual code in them. Uh, they just say load the class file instead. And JRuby can do that. JRuby can actually load a class file uh, as a script instead of a, instead of an RE file. So now, if we actually decompile one of these class files, um, this is what the resulting Java code actually looks like. Um, yeah, so, so as you kind of scroll down here, you can see uh, a whole bunch of godly code here. It didn't even actually decompile anything. It just has like raw JVM instructions dumped out here. Um, so you do see some things like, you know, you'll see method names, for example, but um, uh, very little else to give you any indication of what was actually going on in the original script. Uh, so that's that. Right. Um, okay, next demo. So uh, as I was doing this, I found that I could actually run run Warbler and Warble itself into a jar file. So I actually made a task for that in, in Warbler's rig file. So 
So I can actually create use Warbler to create a jar file of itself. Now we have a Warbler jar. And I'll just copy Warbler jar to So now you see I have a warbler jar here, so I can actually say Java minus jar warbler blah blah blah, um, uh, and actually run warbler itself out of a jar file to then create a ring piano jar file. Oh, recursion for the wind, for the wind. Um, and then I was thinking about the Samora. Well, you know, what else can we do? We can actually use a lot of make a lot of other Ruby utilities into executable jar files. I have successfully done this for Rake. Uh, Rake works fine. It actually, you can do this for Rails as well. So what, what I did is, uh, if you look at the actual Rails gem itself, it doesn't have very much in it, right? It just had this list of the, the Rails script in a bin directory and a gem spec file. So if I run a here, this will actually create a Rails 3 or whoops. Let's see if I can actually, uh, there's one more demo I can do here. I'm not sure why the Rails one is, isn't working. But I was able earlier to do the same thing with Rails and actually bundle Rails up into a, a jar file. It's not actually that interesting because then basically all you can do with that Rails jar is use it to create an, a, 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 a fresh Rails application. But then once you go into the Rails application, you still have to start using your development tools, bundler, and install the gen and everything. I don't think you can actually continue to develop with Rails in a jar file, but I suppose it's somebody really wants to do that, you can try. Uh, one thing I was going to try to do here, since I think I still have a couple minutes, is um, I'll just create a little rack application. I'll say use rack. Um, Here's my, I can do this and actually do executable. And I can do the same thing before with Java, Java minus jar, crack.org. And this will start up Windstone again. And we can go over here and uh, I got a syntax error. Yeah, I missed I missed an extra bracket, square bracket in my config RU. But you see, it's actually detecting the config RU and saying, okay, that looks like a rack, rack application, or it could be Sinatra or what have you, and it bundles that up and gets it gets it going for you. So the thing I was going to show you before was um, now that I have my environment set up properly for the world here, um, I was picking up an older version. It'll actually create a Rails jar. Okay, you get the idea. So let's go back to this 
lives for a couple minutes. All right, so I've just shown you a, you know, a variety of demos. Hopefully some of them are, are somewhat compelling to you as ways that you could actually build and distribute new applications. That was obviously the whole that idea of the talk, but well, what's next? What, what else can we do here? Well, um, it's largely up to you, but I do have a couple ideas of things I could do to, to make this more interesting going forward. Um, first one is to, since uh, you'll notice that the startup of the compiled jar, the, the jar files and the work files was a little bit slow, and that's because uh, well, first of all, starting up application of the JVM is a little bit slow in general, but add to that the fact that you have to unpack a bunch of stuff out of the jar file before you can run. So I'm thinking, well, if you actually want to distribute these as little utilities and actually be able to use them repeatedly and not be overwhelmed by the startup of unpacking everything all the time before they run, um, we could actually maybe make a little local cache on disk where stuff gets unpacked and we make sure that um, we track the versions or checksums of things that you're unpacking and make sure that that's, if that stuff is present, we won't actually do the unpack stuff, we'll just set up uh, those jar files directly and you can just run and, and maybe that will be a way to make repeated uses of these utilities uh, a little bit more pleasant in terms of startup time. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I think it'd be nice to actually try some other web servers as well. Winstone is um, one that's been around for a while in Java and it's, it's not really maintained anymore. It seems to work pretty well, but um, uh, maybe using something like Jetty, which is also another Java web server that's uh, a good embedding, uh, embeddable web server as well, which is, uh, has the advantage of being maintained currently would be a better option or something to play with. Um, another thing to look at, there's, there was a Summer of Code project this year, um, I forget the fellow's name, but he worked on a project called Ruby Archive. And the point of Ruby Archive was to make uh, it kind of do a similar, similar thing where you have um, zip archives with Ruby files in them and you can transparently re require them, load them, and run them from within the archives. And so he did some work there to kind of define some standards around that. I'd like to see if there's some synergies there and I can maybe support Ruby archive or you know, maybe he can support some of what I'm doing, that sort of thing. Uh, another idea I've had for a while, which I think would be really cool to do, is say you've got a, a, a Rails application that you make a war file out of. Uh, but a lot of people ask, well, what do you do about the migrations then? You know, you have a, you have a war file, you still need to run the migration somehow. And I usually give some protracted set of steps like, okay, well, you need to unpack the war file manually and then run rake db migrate and it, you know, makes people throw up in their mouth a little bit. So I think, you know, okay, we can fix that. And I think wouldn't it be cool to be able to say, okay, well, I've got a war file um, and allow me to use rake on the war file itself. And I can just pass my rake command line along with the, uh, the java minus jar command, kind of like this. And that would probably still have to unpack some things. Uh, but this would allow you to hand your ops people a war file, give them one extra command, say, OK, well, before you deploy this, just run this one command line, and it will migrate your database for you, or you know, maybe run some other rake task for you. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, your feedback would be appreciated. If you think this stuff is, is cool, please uh, check it out and let me know what kinds of ideas you have for use of this kind of thing, and give them some of your bucks. And I just, oops, I just released um, a beta one of Warrior 1.3, which has all this stuff in it that I just showed you. So you can install that now. I hope to have a 1.3 final out within a week or so, just lead up to RubyConf and getting things working, preventing me from fixing bugs and doing a few uh, pieces of polish before I get the, re the full release out. Um, so do check that out, and thanks for coming. I think that pretty much wraps up what I have here. Um, I do have some engineering and JRuby stickers up here. If you're interested in one of those, feel free to stop up and grab one. Uh, thanks a lot. <laughs>